I'm going to be the podium speaker, not the peripatetic speaker. And I'm very glad to be here in such good and thought-provoking company. I think we have a lot to learn from each other. Thank you for inviting me, Brandon. I think I'm here because for many months I've been declaring and proposing and insisting that we who care about our students' lives and institutions of learning must redefine their worth or the terms of what is valued and what performance means will be defined for us. Last February, I attended the annual meeting of the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, NICU, in Washington, DC, where I listened to a panel of young congressional staff voice the challenges that many of their bosses, members of Congress, are posing. They asked, what is the return on investment for the $150 billion in federal grants, loans, and tax credits to higher education. They suggested that this investment must have a payoff measurable in terms of number of degrees completed, jobs attained, and salaries earned. Not once in the session did I hear about the return in terms of our democracy, our larger common good. I never heard the words civic engagement or citizenship. By the time I got to Scott Jassick's office at Inside Higher Ed the next day, I was perturbed. I'll tell you why, but first, I need to acknowledge the problem. President Obama and Congress are concerned about who will be qualified for the jobs of the future about our nation's economic competitiveness, where more and more jobs will require at least some college, about attendance and completion rates, the ever-rising cost and the accumulated debt. The public, as reported in the media constantly, question the cost, the prospects for a job to pay off student loans, and whether graduates are employed, underemployed, or moving back home with mom or dad. I speak and interact with parents and high school students at all Marlboro College admissions days and very, very frequently in between. And when the recession hit in 2008, I started to hear this anxious question. What do you do with a liberal arts degree? Even more urgently these days, even as schools and colleges struggle to contain costs, we must answer the question, is a college degree worth it? Worth the cost, debt, time, and uncertainty about whether the graduate will be able to support herself and a family, as well as find a sense of achievement, engagement, and well-being in life. Searching for that answer, I'm attracted to the depth of Gallup's research and the very reason for this conference. Our formulation of value should not be either or, but both and. Not either education for liberation or education for vocation. Not innovation or employment. Not a life of security or a life of engaged learning. We must aspire to both and more. Not preparation for a changing world only for privileged students, but also for first generation and low income students. So as I tell you my argument with today's proposed measures of value, I'm addressing higher aspirations for everyone, including that one third of Marlboro students receiving Pell grants. Now, if you haven't guessed it yet, I'll reveal my partisanship. I guess Brandon already did. I'm a lifelong Democrat who served Senator Leahy of Vermont's, as Senator Leahy of Vermont's Chief of Staff for 10 years, and as Deputy Assistant to President Clinton and advisor to Hillary Clinton. But I do have an argument with President Obama and his Department of Education. Right after the President's State of the Union address this year, the White House released a scorecard purported to measure the performance and value of higher education. How? By reporting 
by individual institution, net price, six-year graduation rate, the median amount borrowed, loan default rate, and type of job and salary earned after graduation. The public deserves to know these data, but they alone do not define the value of the college experience. And now we have the Student Right to Know Before You Go Act, co-sponsored by Democratic Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon and Republican Senator Marco Rubio from Florida, which would require colleges and universities to disclose the earnings of alumni and their employment to prospective students. Now, what if the recent graduate is in the Peace Corps, or AmeriCorps, or Teach for America? What if she is courageously and excitedly creating her own choreography, or making a movie, or inventing new green technology while supporting herself at a lower paying job? At that NICU conference, Scott Jessick had challenged those higher education leaders. He said, We've already lost the argument about value. As I fulminated in Scott's office about the civic and other missions of college, he invited me to propose a different means of value, different measure of value, something I'm calling the civic scale. But first, let's look at the scorecard in the senator's proposal. Do you see the trend? It's all about the money. We need to redefine return on investment. What about the return on the individual? Return on intellectual investigation? Return for the broader community and to keep the acronym and the alliteration? Return on informed interaction? That's why I want to make a case for that misunderstood term, the liberal arts. We don't mean liberal politically, and we don't mean only the arts, but also the disciplines of the sciences, social sciences, and the humanities. We do mean that we teach from the world's storehouse of knowledge, thinking about what it means to be human, how to ask better questions, how to create ideas, action, and art that never existed before. Derived from the Greek and Latin, liberal comes from the word for free. From medieval times until recent history, universities taught prescribed courses thought to constitute knowledge worthy of the free man. And until not long ago, such education was for men. But our sense of liberal is liberation, that we might be liberated by an education in service of human freedom. So says William Cronin in his 1998 article in The American Scholar. He asks, what makes a liberally educated person? It's not the transfusion of facts or content, but rather a set of skills and qualities. To paraphrase Cronin, they are to listen and to hear knowing how to pay attention, to follow an argument, to read and to understand, to write clearly and persuasively to solve a variety of problems, to respect rigor as a way of seeking truth, to love learning, to practice humility, tolerance, and self-criticism, opening yourself to different perspectives, to understand how things get done in the world, to nurture and empower the people around you, recognizing that no one acts alone. To connect, the ability to see connections that allow one to make sense of the world and act creatively within it. These are the competencies for the 21st century. And all this sounded so familiar to my Marlboro College audience recently, because I describe the qualities of a Marlboro education. And I've lavished some of our time today on these to make Cronin's final point. Education for human freedom is also education for human community. In other words, for the social good, for the culture of connection. 
I know this sounds good, but does it solve the problem of ROI? I can stand here and tell you that these are the very skills and qualities that will allow students to get jobs, keep learning, and keep adapting as the economy and the society changes. But let's hear employers make the case. And this reinforces what you've heard from Tony and Josh. This June, the American Association of Colleges and Universities released a survey that asked employers what skills employees need to be successful in their careers. And it found 93% of respondents, the employers, reported a demonstrated capacity to think critically, communicate clearly, and solve complex problems is more important than the major. More than nine in 10 stress the importance of demonstrating ethical judgment and integrity intercultural skills, and the capacity for new learning. Employers want colleges to emph emphasize five critical areas. This is going to start sounding very familiar. Critical thinking, complex problem solving, written and oral communication skills, and applied knowledge in real world settings. Employers favor graduates who know how to conduct research using evidence-based analysis and to apply that learning. And the majority of employers agree that having both field-specific knowledge and a broad range of skills is important for long-term success. These are the very skills and qualities that a liberating arts education imparts. Best taught when the individual takes ownership for his or her own education, understanding the intellectual and creative skills needed designing her own course of study, as we do at Marlboro College, including practice in real world settings. As Tony says, students become the architects of their own learning. We can change the debate about value. Why don't we create a scorecard for becoming an educated citizen? We can work together to create a new civic scale, which does three things understands what attributes or behaviors contribute to furthering democracy, what levels of participation, freedom and, um, and responsibility occur at schools, in the classroom, and are demonstrated by teachers, those models and mentors, analyzes our course offerings, independent studies, and engaged learning opportunities to, to determine to what extent we teach democratic behavior surveys alumni at various stages of their lives to ask if they're demonstrating key civic attributes. Educators and social sciences scientists here at this conference can show what we already know about the relationship between civic engagement and student success and bore into what we don't know. Some questions to ask alumni might be, do you vote? How often? Do you volunteer with a community organization? Have you run for office? Do you give to your favorite causes? Attend civic meetings or organize to make change? Do you participate in your children's schools? Do you attend cultural or other events that strengthen your community's life? Do you work for a nonprofit or an organization focused on education, the arts, or social justice? You can formulate other such questions. At Marlboro College, students, faculty, and st staff convene in a monthly town meeting to discuss and decide on the standards by which we will govern our community life together at this small liberal arts college. Students learn to present their arguments cogently and persuasively. They also learn to challenge a point with which they disagree with evidence and reasoning. These are valuable skills for practicing democracy. As reported by the Vermont Community Foundation, research shows that college graduates are more likely to have children who perform well in school, vote, volunteer, serve on civic boards, and support the arts. They're also more likely to engage in entrepreneurial endeavors, creating jobs for others. Students should think 
about their whole lives, not only as employees, but as members of the human family and as citizens. They will benefit greatly by committing themselves to the college years of curiosity, inquiry, and discovery. And we must help them afford it. The return will be to master research methods and new knowledge, to think beyond disciplinary boundaries, and develop capacities for creativity and clear expression. What do you do with a liberal arts education? You adapt to economic change, yes. You also live a richer life with creativity and with commitment. You do a job. You also become a person engaged with the world, the kind of educated citizen we so desperately need in our democracy. Thank you.